A child's opinion of God is often shaped by the treatment by his earthly father. We're going to discuss that next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? I recently saw another book that has been published by a woman who was raised in the LeBaron Polygamy Group, and the title of the book resonated with me in a huge way simply because it actually paralleled my thinking and many of my experiences growing up in polygamy. Several years ago, I was listening to Charles Stanley, and he was talking about how a child's view of God will reflect his love, the love and the treatment that he received from his earthly father. If the child's earthly father is angry, a hard disciplinarian, always critical, or if he rejects or ignores the children, they will often think it reflects God's attitude towards them. Immediately, I related to this statement because it was true in my own case. My father was rarely there, and he disciplined harshly. He never once expressed love and care for us during our childhood, and our performance determined his approval of us. We couldn't call him our father because our mother was a plural wife, not a legal wife. And that was the same opinion I had of God. If a child is afraid of their human father, they will often be afraid of God himself. That was my story, and it is the story of the author of this book. It is entitled, Dad Scares Me, God Scares Me, written by Vera Lurie. Now, the author changed the names of the people that she writes about in the book, even the name of the group and its leaders. Mm. Uh, But from what I could determine, it was very easy easy to determine that it was the LeBaron polygamy group, uh, the one that was started by the LeBaron brothers who were ruling the group, and Earl LeBaron, of course, who was out killing everybody who he thought were (laughs) rivals. The author's mother gave birth to 13 children from her polygamous father, seven sons and six daughters, and she was the sixth child of her mother. She talks about her early memories and experiences growing up in the polygamy culture, about the abuse, the anger, the neglect, Mm -hmm. and fear that her father instilled in her so that whenever he came around, she was afraid. That same fear was transferred to the God that they believed required their poverty and their polygamy and their pain. The rivalry in the early LeBaron polygamy group is described in chapter one, but she calls them the Adonites. Adonites. Yeah, we quote this. And this is from pages five and six. The Adonites attacked this town a few years ago. They threw hand grenades through the windows and onto the roof, which set our house on fire. Luckily, it was put out before the whole house burned down. Who are the Adonites, I asked. They are really bad people, she warned. Our prophet Jerome has a brother named Adon, who also wanted to be a prophet. After fighting with Jerome, he left to start a church of his own, taking some of his followers with him. He now claims to be the one almighty prophet and has committed several murders in the name of God, including the murder of our prophet, his own brother, We have been told there is a list of members from our church who he's planning to kill, including your dad. So that kind of sets the stage of the (laughs) group, and it's easy to pick out that this was what was going on in the LeBaron group during those days. Yeah. And I'm still at a loss of how polygamists, or anyone for that matter, can believe that God is pleased with murderous, uh, violent, and hostile behavior. Very strange. You know, it's just, it is strange. The early Mormons suffered hostile behavior from some of the people where they lived, but they themselves were hostile and violent to many of the residents of the places in which they moved to. Some of what they suffered was a direct result of their own ungodly beliefs, and it's okay to steal and cheat and lie to people who were not Mormons. That's what they believed in the early Mormon uh, church, and polygamists still believe that today. Let alone lying for the Lord, but Uh, stealing or doing anything mm -hmm. is... If they weren't, if they weren't LDS in Missouri, that's one reason they had so many troubles in the Missouri, because they would just they would go raid their neighbors' farms or whatever and steal from them, and it was okay because they weren't Mormons. Wow, that wasn't a public doctrine, by no. the way. <laughs> no, no. 
Actually, like I said, it is part of the nature of Mormonism, so it's no wonder that polygamists, who are called fundamental, uh, will do what the early church did. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In the Mormon religion, marriage is a huge part of their doctrinal belief and behavior. It's an even more important part in the polygamy groups, we quote. Yes, from page 9, intro to chapter 2. In all religions, heaven to a seven-year-old can, uh, can be a tad confusing. Some children are told they are the chosen, which automatically makes them heaven-worthy. They can steal, they can lie, they can disobey their parents, but they still get to go to heaven. And then there are some, like myself, who are told they must marry their way there. That, and that scared the daylights out of me. What if no one wants to marry me? Or what if we run out of mush and I starve to death before I meet a boy? What then, I wondered? What happens to the girl who never makes it to the altar? And those are the and thinkings are of a young girl yeah. in a polygamy group. Yeah. Now, the idea that certain people are the chosen, which automatically makes them worthy, of course, is heretical. Uh, that's also what the Kingston polygamy group teaches. They believe that if you've got Kingston blood, it's all, you're it. You're, yeah. No matter what sin you do, except, of course, the sin of rejecting the polygamy group. Uh, that one can't be forgiven. But how often does the Bible teach that God does not show favoritism? Obviously, more times than the polygamous teachers and prophets care to discover, God is not a respecter of persons. We are all lost in our sinful human behavior, and we all who turn to Jesus alone for forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life are accepted equally by Him. God mm -hmm. does not show any favoritism. And about marriage being so important to make people <laughs> heaven worthy, since when did Jesus step aside and proclaim that marriage is the Savior and that he's just an icon or an afterthought? The only Savior is Jesus Christ, and there is no co-Savior. Polygamy, marriage, right. the temple, nothing is the co-Savior. It's Jesus alone, by grace alone, and the Bible alone for doctrine. Anything else is a teaching foreign to God's salvation, which was established because of and through his love before the creation of the world and certainly before Joseph Smith came <laughs> on the scene. Yeah. The author explains that her polygamous father's family was so large that it was all he could do to put food on the table uh, for them to eat, so food was constantly in short supply. Mm. And so she said no one complained about what they did get. They ate whatever was put in front of them and was even thankful for a few grains of sugar. She said that she often rummaged through the piles of dirty clothes just to find her cleanest dirty dress to wear. That clean clothes were a novelty. With all those kids, it was impossible for her mother to keep up with the laundry. And that statement was also a flashback <laughs> to my own childhood. You remember that, things like but that. But does God really want families to grow up like that? Where does it ever say that God demands huge families that are impossible to support? It doesn't. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, because it's so relevant, we're going to quote again what we've quoted before, what God has to say about a man supporting his own family. Yeah, it's pretty clear. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So there's ways of denying the faith <laughs> rather than just by words. That's right. <laughs> Ironically, Mormonism boasts about how family-oriented they are, but their foundational behavior actually opposes polygamous men taking proper care of their large families. Mormon polygamous families from the beginning uh, have not been fully and, and properly provided for. Just read some of those stories of oh. Joseph Smith's wives and, yeah. and some of these other men. And they were just in all sorts of poverty, rarely seen to unless a neighbor or somebody yeah. decided to take them in hand. Um, and, 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 and so that's never changed. It hasn't. <laughs> really. No, it hasn't no. changed. No. So the people who aren't taking care of their family are in pretty bad company because infidels is pretty bad. Yeah. Jesus said that her father's preaching um, included a, a lot of big words, uh, most of which she didn't understand. <laughs> but when she did understand was that there were three degrees of heaven, but only one level of hell. And if they did not obey the Ten Commandments, hell is where they would end up. Yeah. But keeping the Ten Commandments could only buy their way to the lowest level of heaven. 
we quote from one of his sermons. Yeah, chapter, um, pages 12 and 13 from the book, she writes, how many of you here want to go to the highest level? <clears throat> Show me with a raise of hand if you want to go to the highest level. We all raised our hands, including my father. Then you must all take the law of celestial marriage seriously, like I have, he said. There is no other way to make it to the highest level except through living this law. I have sacrificed my life for the sake of plural marriage, which is another way of saying celestial marriage. Right then and there, I vowed to live this law no matter what it took. There was no other way for me to gain God's love and approval, which is the only thing that would keep me safe from hell. So this is her early childhood indoctrination. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, what we all will go through. <laughs> it's impossible for anyone to always keep the Ten Commandments. So this is a false savior and a false heaven and a false gospel. How can marriage or religiously accepted adultery ever be the savior? I, I still scratch my head with that. <laughs> And why does Mormonism so often completely reverse what the Bible teaches? They turn it upside down and inside out and take it out of context and call it progressive revelation. From the Bible, we read this about marriage. You know, these three scriptures all come from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. There Pretty you go. Clear. To the unmarried and to the, and to the widows, I say that it is a it is good for them to remain single as I am. That was Paul. Mm -hmm. So then the last one is so then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. <laughs> and Mormonism teaches the opposite of this. It sure does. And again, they will they will fall back on, well, you can't trust the Bible. It had to be restored. It's been yeah. corrupted and blah, blah, blah. But but how much of the Bible has been corrupted and who are they to say which parts have been? Yeah. And they don't have any evidence to show that these were changed particularly. Right, I don't right. Think, so. Not, no. <laughs> yeah. So, but they changed it and call it progressive revelation. That's right. She, she write, the author of this book writes that she learned um, what God expected of her. And these things that she learned were that women were the lesser of the two sexes. They were to be submissive, that the men were to marry as many young wives as possible and guide their families with a stern hand. Women would not get to heaven on their own. And plural wives were to obey their husbands just like his children were to obey him. That puts her in a pretty low yeah. position, doesn't it? On the, yeah. No wonder the children grow up being scared to death of their father and of God. Another example is, is how their fright of God develops through the physical abuse of their father. On pages 20 through 22, she tells the story of four of her brothers who were caught stealing quarters and how their father disciplined the boys. It was a harsh and cruel discipline where the boys were mercilessly beaten with a belt and each child in the family was required to participate in beating them. Oh dear. She writes this about her response to this wicked abuse. I don't understand God's laws, but I'm afraid to break them. I'm afraid of disobeying my fathers, both of them, the one who lives in heaven and the one who lives on earth. I cannot disobey either of them. And the only thing I knew for sure was this, dad scares me, God scares me. And there you have it. Yeah. And that just made me want to cry for her yeah. because the same thing, I went through exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing when I was growing up. The same thoughts, all of it. No love at all. No, no, yeah. no. Uh, the women were were less than men, Second, and, yeah. and 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 the treatment of the earthly father, how easily it can determine and be transferred into how the child views the father in heaven. So sad. It is sad, <laughs> and it's a horrible spurching and and defamation of God's character that uh, yeah. it does in the minds that these polygamous men do in the minds of these children. Of course, I knew nothing of God's love uh, growing up under the religious lies of the polygamy groups and the religious lies are not being turned into the truth about God. They still are propagating. They're still uh, telling these lies to the people. She said that 
that her father only came to their house occasionally and that part of her was glad that he rarely showed up because while he was there, she was so afraid of him yeah. and didn't like being afraid. And she was always relieved and glad when he left. Again, this is so parallel to my own experience and no doubt to hundreds, maybe even thousands of other polygamous children. Uh, she tells of her desire that her father be proud of her. Even though she was afraid of him and, and he showed very little attention to yeah. her, she still had that him. inner desire that a daughter has yeah. that her father would love her and be proud of her. But that was also an elusive expectation on her part. Now, that part of her story is not parallel with my experience. My father rejected me, or so I thought, so I rejected him. Mm. And I didn't care if he was proud of me or not. That, and that's what I did with God. Exactly the same thing. I rejected him. I didn't care if he was proud of me or not. The only way they could be proud of me is to be a polygamist in the polygamy group, and I wouldn't do that. So it just went out wow. the window. It was just gone. As, as she grew older, uh, two of her older sisters married, and her older brother left home. So if she was 11 years old. She was the oldest child mm. left at home. And her mother was emotionally distraught and overwhelmed. She had little help from her polygamist husband and, of course, was constantly competing for his attention and for his resources that were never fulfilled. She said at 11 years old, she was just a little girl trying her best to survive the pitfalls of being born into a world where daughter's worth is never acknowledged by men or by God. The family lived in Baja, Mexico until she was 11, and then her father planned on moving all of his wives and children to uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. Mm. She made an interesting remark about the move. <laughs> on page 46, we're finally here, I thought. This is the place where it all started. This is the place God asked his people to live to escape the final day calamities in the U.S. This is the promised land. Suddenly, I felt confused. Why had Dad moved his family to Baja if God had planned to establish his kingdom here? Had planned to, his kingdom here. It didn't make any sense to me, but I decided it didn't matter. We are in our new home, the promised land, where we will be part of a community doing God's work. <laughs> now, I found that amazing in reading yeah, that. it really is. Because... Every place that the Mormon polygamists have lived since the very beginning, yeah. they have believe and teach that that place is the promised Promise land, land. <laughs> the, yeah. the special place of God's protection and favor. And every polygamy group, wherever they live, will, the will they think that's their promised land. <laughs> um, now, the only place in the Bible that ever refers to as the promised land geographically is the land of Israel. Even at that, God is omnipresent meaning he's everywhere, always, all at the same time True. with each one of us. And, um, and he can protect his people wherever they are, whether in the bottom of the ocean in a submarine or on a spaceship headed for the moon. God <laughs> is there and can protect you. So yeah. we don't have to worry about what is a promised land uh, in, in our lives. Another dilemma that this woman relates to and is, is repeated hundreds of times over in polygamy is the loneliness and the neglect that her mother suffered. She could see the pain of it written all over her face and her heart ached for her mother. She said she thought about God and wondered why he expected her mother to suffer so much, why he loved his sons more than he loved his daughters and why women couldn't make it to heaven without a man. Now, this, of course, isn't true, <laughs> right. but she didn't know that, no. and neither do today's polygamists, and neither do the members of the LDS Church. They all believe you have to have a man to get to heaven. Yeah. She'd crawl into bed at night, exhausted from all the work that she was required to do, and she said this. Yeah, pages 80 and 81. I would pray to God, a God I knew had no use for me, a girl, a God whom I was sure had better things to do than to listen to my prayers. But even though I constantly struggled with my own feelings of unworthiness, I never gave up on praying to him, believing with all my heart that one day I would make him very proud of me. So every night before drifting off to sleep, I whispered, someday I will <clears throat> gain your love, God, someday. That's sad. It is sad. And he, he loved her right that moment while she was praying that. Yeah. 
her father would visit them in their new home every five or six months. <laughs> but when he did, he just preached fire and brimstone, which always left her feeling as if there was no hope for her. She lived in constant doom and gloom. She was sure that the devil's inferno was waiting for her just around the corner. After one of her dad's visits, which left her feeling totally hopeless, she decided that she would write down what God requires her to do in order to go to heaven. Her list was to follow the Ten Commandments, listen to what her father taught about the prophets, be an obedient daughter, and live celestial marriage, which of course is polygamy. How sad that the children in these polygamy groups are all taught so many lies about God, about how to get to heaven, and about eternal life. They all claim the Bible can't be trusted, which puts fear into the children so they don't even read the Bible, but they read Mormon material instead, and that's the devil's victory. Yeah. You'll have to read the whole book to get her full story. She ended up marrying and having children with her dead sister's husband. And of course, he was a polygamist. Mm, yeah. And she discovered after many years that reading the Mormon scriptures, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenant, and the Pearl of Grace, Great Price, she said she would read it and all it did was instill fear, fear and guilt into her. And so one time she got tired of it and she took the books and threw them across the room and said <laughs> she wasn't going to read them anymore, <laughs> you know. And so at that point, a different spiritual journey began yeah. for her. But unfortunately, it did not take her to God's Word in which all spiritual truth mm -hmm. can be found. When she told her father, the one she feared so dreadfully, that she was no longer going to live the plural marriage life, nor be manipulated by him or by her polygamous husband, he flew into a rage and threatened her with every evil retribution the Mormon polygamist can invent. During this confrontation, she asked her father this question. <laughs> Why did God give me a brain to figure things out if I'm supposed to just do whatever you and your prophets say I should do? Why would God give me the ability to think if he didn't want me to think for myself? Good question. Is Very good question. Now, she said a lot of other things as well, which we, of course, don't have the time to go through everything. Yeah. Things that actually made sense. <laughs> and it stumped her father. He didn't yeah, have any answers. <laughs> Probably that she had that much spunk, but, yeah. but the, her, her questions were good. They were logical. Yeah. So uh, finally, after a long speechless moment, he said that she must be suffering from a chemical imbalance and she needed to take care of it. <laughs> now, what else could he say? Yeah. You know, what else? It, it, it had to be her fault, you know, yeah. obviously. And then God again, gave her the brain to think. <laughs> yeah. um, and then again, truth doesn't really matter in Mormonism when you're trying to That's true. to bring Mormon logic, Mormon doctrine, logically. Now, I don't know the author of this book, our, but our thoughts and fears are so parallel. Yeah. I, I feel a connection mm -hmm. to her somehow. <laughs> You'd enjoy talking to her. I would. Sure. I would like to meet her, and 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 tell her of the enormous love that God has for her, that the the that Jesus Christ is the only Savior and He is the only God. The only way to the Father in heaven is through Jesus. And I would love to explain to her that God's love is higher and longer and deeper and wider than she can ever imagine. And I pray that every person who escapes the abusive and terror-filled doctrines of Mormon polygamy groups will find the true God. Too many of them turn away from Him because of the experiences they've had. Yeah. It was evil people who did those evil things to you. It wasn't God, and it wasn't His doctrines. God is good, and He does no wrong. And He didn't just say He loves us. He demonstrated His love when He stretched out His arms and allowed wicked men to nail Him to a cross. And in that, He would pay for our sins. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead for our justification. I would love to tell her that yeah, because be she a, went another direction. be a neat conversation. It There's would. even a lot of mainstream Mormons, though, LDS, that mm -hmm. uh, 
don't take God or Jesus with them. They mm -hmm. don't really know, and they're disappointed in what they've given themselves to. Mm -hmm. They really believe, I, you don't say it this way, but the church really is the Savior, mm -hmm. the temple and mm -hmm. the tithing that you pay to the church, the service you render to the church. That becomes... Uh, uh, your savior. And or it's polygamy. the same with the polygamy group. It's the same the thing. The polygamy is in and a whole other level, the, of the, course. The, the church is the savior, and then your works for the church is the co-savior. Yeah. You have to have it both. So when you find out the church may have problems or it's not true, then you back away and you don't have Jesus to go with you. And, and <laughs> like you said, so many of them who leave the Mormon church and also the polygamy groups, which is what I did for 25 years. I just left it all behind. Now, I didn't turn atheist. I knew there was a God. I yeah. just didn't like him and I didn't want to have anything to do and with he, the one I had learned about. And he, you didn't think he loved you either. No, I didn't know <laughs> he loved me. Um, but so many of them will just throw it all out, not realizing that these people lied to them about everything else they need to realize that they lied to him about They've god too, too yeah. that god is a totally different person than yeah. than than just, what they've been told they just don't have a good foundation they have no foundation for the yeah. truth at all thanks earl appreciate you your participation you know i've read that passage several times that kind of teared me up a little bit yeah i just can't believe it. reading it this time in context with everything you said that just someday I hope God loves me. Yeah, it's sad. It's so yeah. sad. Yeah, it is. You know, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 says, quote, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, the spirit of prophecy <laughs> is not the testimony of Joseph Smith or of Mormonism, uh, but is of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said that the volume of the book is written about him. It all points to Jesus and fulfilled in Jesus and by Jesus and nothing and no one else. Jesus told us that John the Baptist was the last of the prophets. So how can there be modern day prophets in Mormonism claiming progressive revelation? Is God a liar? Did Jesus uh, deceive us? And are, uh, are those who believe in the Mormon idea of prophets, are they the ones who are deceived? Jesus warned Watch out, he said, that no one deceive you, which means we can be deceived. The measure of all spiritual truth is found in the Bible only. only. So read it and study it and be amazed by it and watch out because it will not only amaze you, it will also change you. Thank you for watching. <laughs>